ุณgood morning and uh, welcome to the community and economic development committee it's uh thursday august 4th here 11 a.m 2022 should be mentioned and uh we are scheduled today from 11 a.m to 12 30 p.m this is a uh, microsoft teams meeting and um so i'll call this to order and mandy if you could uh Read the roll, please. Yes. Do roll call. Mr. Peterson. Present. Mr. Constant. Mr. Rivera. Present. Miss Allard. Here. Mr. Salt. Mr. Cross. Here. And for other assembly members not on the committee, Mr. Dunbar, Ms. LaFrance, Mr. Perez Verdia, Ms. Quinn Davidson, Mr. Voland, Ms. Zalatel. Chair, you have a quorum. Great. Well, thank you, Mandy. And um, I, uh, if anyone would like to get in the queue, uh, please uh, use the chat. I'll be keeping track of that. And I guess we will be going to our first item of new business, a presentation on uh, the Holton Hill subdivision down in uh, Girdwood, I believe. Do you have this presentation for us, uh, Mr. Trombley? I sent it to Miranda, so she it should have. If I don't know if you have it where you can pull it up or share share on the screen, I might be able to go ahead and share my. Oh, there, there it is. There it is. There it is. So, well, first I, I want to thank the assembly and the committee for giving me the time to do this. Um, this is a this is a large project, very complicated, and I think it's always important to keep the assembly updated on what what we're doing, especially when there's. Um, some actions that the assembly we're going to request the assembly take in the future. Um, that way, things don't just come in cold to you without any back backstory or history. Um, so we have this little presentation. It's not very much, um, just very high level at this point. And of course, I'm always open for more uh, for more detailed questions after this. I also have um, Connie Oshimura with CY Investments here as well. To, to kind of lead off the discussion and then and then I can address some things in the future. So I'm going to toss toss this over to Connie. Uh, well, Adam, thank you very much, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, if we uh, can scroll or ch keep changing the uh, to the next page to the next page, please. There we go. All right. So here's a little something about me. Um, I have been uh, in the real estate business for over uh, 40 years. I always say I started when I was just a teenager, but that's not quite true. Um, and I came to Alaska because I wanted to uh, make enough money and be in real estate so I could quit work and write poetry. But what I found was that a real estate is a very creative process. Every development is different. Every buyer is different. Every seller is different. All the reasons why people buy and sell homes is different. So uh, a lot of people are curious about my name. So what I want to say is that a lot of people think that I'm married to some wealthy Japanese man who has funded me in my land development activities. But uh, unfortunately, that's not the case. I've always used my sales commissions to reinvest back into my community with residential land development. Just for clarity's sake, if anyone wonders, I am a third generation Japanese American and I've always carried my maiden name in honor of my father. Uh, here are some of the projects that I've done in if the If you past. could go to the next page. Right, please. 
Uh, so I have been, although most of you know me as a realtor and someone who's been involved in sales activities, uh, sort of uh, behind all of that are, um, here are the subdivisions that I have been involved in, either as a partner, a manager, or marketed. Um, I've also done multifamily, and uh, I've also, in my company, which is now Berkshire Hathaway Home Services, Alaska Realty, we uh, also have in, we have a commercial department as well as residential. We also provide homeowners association management and residential and commercial property management. So here is over the years, here are some of the builders that um, we've uh, worked with. Uh, in Anchorage, in the Valley, and in Eagle River, and actually Girdwood. Um, so in 2021, the Heritage Land Bank put out an RFP to develop a portion of their Girdwood holdings. And uh, the RFP was awarded in a nine to zero vote in favor of CY Investments uh, proposal. Here is a list of all the people that were on the committee uh, that voted, and those include some people uh, that were quite familiar with uh, Girdwood as well. This proposal, uh, let's next, see. Yeah, if you could go yeah. to the next page, I'm sorry. Yeah. We got to remember this is, um, th this here are the members that were on that committee uh, that, that voted 9 0. So you can see again, there are three members from, from Girdwood, a mix of um, private individuals as well as uh, folks here in the in the city. Some of these names you'll absolutely re uh, recognize. And I, I also wanted to point out that I uh, have no relations to the Peterson Group, even though the name is spelled the same as as mine. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Thank Jean. you. Thank All right. You. Uh, next page, please. So, uh, yeah, the accepted proposal was is a partnership between Heritage Land Bank and CY Investments with a planned unit community development overlaid by a conditional use, includes the cost of the entitlement process and approvals, land contribution with financing for roads, water, sewer, and gas and electric by CY Investments with a 50-50 share of profits. So the original RFP was for 448.9 acres. The three tracks that will be developed into Holton Hills are only 60.1 acres. And that's sort of a popular misconception, I think, that uh, is important for all of us to understand. Phase one is proposed for 15.9 acres. Phase two for 17.9 acres. Phase three uh, for 26.3 acres. The excess land totals 388.8 acres. So over here on the left-hand side, we've outlined the three tracks as well as all of the total acreage. And so once the boundaries for the three tracks are established and approved by the planning board through the public process, the excess land will be transferred back to Heritage Land Bank with no ties whatsoever to CY Investments. So uh, I think that that's important for everyone to understand. There were two key points that contributed. Uh, next, next page, please. Yeah, sorry. There were two key points that contributed to the award. Um, the first one being what I like to classify as mixed density to provide entry level to luxury housing, uh, a wide variety of price points to include duplex condos, townhouses, fourplexes, small lot single family, and a handful of single family luxury home sites. Girdwood currently has uh, luxury homes, you know, with a starting cost probably value of somewhere between six to $2 million. The current zoning um, also affords luxury, what I would call luxury townhomes which currently are under construction starting at the high sevens and going up to higher. So a mix of housing types and lot sizes increases residential density, which in turn helps create, in my opinion, a local population large enough to support a vibrant community. Many people in Girdwood, they would like to have a larger st a grocery store. They would like to have a bank. They would like to have a hardware store. 
And unfortunately, those things don't happen until you have higher density and a mix of housing to produce a more diverse range of residents that can participate in all of those commercial and retail activities. This increased population density and vibrancy tends to mean a broader range of services can be supported within walking or cycling di uh, distance. And the other thing that I think is important to understand is that mixed density already exists in Girdwood. It is not a new concept. So you will see a million dollar plus home next to condo condominiums. You will see it next to small ranch homes built in the 1950s. So mixed density for Holton Hills is just a continuation of what already exists in Girdwood. The developer is not a builder. That is the other, I think, important uh, reason that we won the RFP. So we are, so all lots and home sites will be open to a wide variety of builders and private parties. CY investments plan requires planned unit development and conditional use permit approved by planning and zoning. We are a land developer. We're going to do all the planning, all the entitlement work, all of the residential development, but we are not builders. So this will create an opportunity for a variety and a diversity of housing types and styles based upon such things as uh, coming Yeah, to everyone to understand that that diversity uh, will help in creating. Uh, uh, could you could you go to the next page? Yes. Please? And hold on just a second. There we go. Mr. Salt is having a hard time hearing on the phone. He's calling in and in the chat. Miss Honest has uh, put a, a different contact number up uh, for him and their conference ID. So hopefully he'll be able to uh, dial in using that new number and, and have better, uh, be able to hear better. Pete, it looks like this is Jamie. It looks like he's on now. He's on thank now? Thank you for helping. Okay. Yeah, thank All you. All right. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Proceed. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. There are a couple of other things that I think are important. Um, we plan to have a forested and fire wise community. We have done that in the past in other communities. We write those conditions into the covenants, codes and restrictions. So prior to development and, and the construction of homes, clearing limits will be flagged to preserve the natural environment within the community. Um, if I could just take a minute, an extra minute to explain uh, when we're clearing a right of way, we put ribbons around the trees that are to remain uh, beyond the right of way, and we find the general contractor uh, if any of those trees are damaged or cleared, uh, then they have to replace them. Um, also, Holton Hills will be a firewise community, including an emphasis on firewise landscaping and building materials uh, such as shingles that we will write into the architectural control. We will have a homeowners association that we believe helps sustain and increase property values. They will have design criteria and landscaping requirements that preserve the aesthetics of the community. Um, there has been a question about, well, you're just gonna control the homeowners association forever. And that is not the way homeowners associations work. Once in say in phase one, 75% of the lots are sold, then there the there will be a board elected from those 75%, and they will then be the board that controls the homeowners association. That board will select the property management company that will run the homeowners association on behalf of the board and the residents. So we turn that over. I will tell you, we would, of course, want to bid on that opportunity, but it would be a very competitive process, and we don't always uh, continue. Um, each home builder will be required to submit their house plans, exterior siding, and paint color schemes for approval to build. Uh, the design review committee will ensure that plans and specifications meet the criteria 
set forth for the homeowners association. I want to give you, uh, if we could go to the next page, a little bit of history of Holton Hills. So it's named after a, a lifelong Alaskan, Howard Holton. Howard was the director of project management and engineering. I'm director of Alaska Mighty Mice program from the mid 1980s until his untimely death in a plane accident in 2007. What I want to say to you about Howard, not only was he the director of project management and engineering and had the respect of his staff, but he also had the respect of the private development community. His word was good. Uh, if you needed a variance and you went in and you talked to, to Howard about it, uh, he would do his research and he would come back with a definitive answer. Now, that doesn't mean that we wouldn't have had to go to the zoning the zoning board of approval for variances and that sort of thing. But he was uh, uh, so very well respected by the private development community. This is not the first time that Holton Hills has tried to be developed. This is at least the second time. And it has received prior approvals in the past in, on September 2nd, 2009. They granted, the planning board granted a 60 month approval for a 480, a 448 acre subdivision of three tracks. And then on January 6, 2010, the public hearing review of an additional information for a preliminary plat. So there's been several, not several attempts, but at least one very serious attempt to previously develop Holton Hills. And between, um, and I think, Adam, you're going to speak a little bit more about that. Ne and the next Crow page, Creek. please. Yeah, and the Crow Creek Master Plan. We desperately need, as a community, housing of all types and all price ranges. So especially in Girdwood, there has been uh, tremendous appreciation. And I would say, really, that the market has run away, not just because of historically low interest rates, um, and not just because of all the expansion efforts by Pomeroy Lodging that's going to, that has occurred and is going to be occurring in the future for the Alaska Resort. But the highest lot price, it was uh, in 2021, $390,000. This is for a single family lot. The highest single family home sold for $1,775,000. And the highest condo, which was a townhouse style, $978,500. My envision for Holton Hills is that we're going to have a wide variety of housing types and a wide variety of price points. Um, whether it's a thousand square foot condo that would accommodate four people because the bedroom size is 12 by 12, so you could have two beds in there. Um, whether it's uh, uh, rather than a 12,000 square foot lot, it's a, it's a 5,000 or a 6,000 square foot lot. And all of this would be overlaid by a planned unit development and a conditional use. This is not competitive. This is not going to be competitive, what is already going on in the market, but it's going to open up the market and create more opportunities at a reasonable price, thanks to the Heritage Land Bank and the partnership. So if you go to the next page, please, um, we've, ar we've already kind of addressed the fact that this isn't the first, oh, wait a minute, I think this oh, is you. Yeah, yep, this, this is, is still, still you, sorry. Yeah, well, I apologize. Um, the Holton Hills work plan completed and upcoming. Uh, we have Thirdwood Land Use Committee meetings with Heritage Land Bank and CY on June 14th. Section line easement vacation paperwork submitted to the Department of Natural Resources on June 2022. Girdwood Board of Supervisors three track plaque presented by Tony Hoffman from the Triad Engineering on July 18th. A preliminary title report has been ordered. The boundary survey for the 440 acres has been completed. We have weekly part partnership meetings with Heritage Land Bank and CY Investments and there has been formed a housing working group uh, underneath the Girdwood Board of Supervisors. Their first meeting was August 4th and biweekly thereafter. 
Um, upcoming is the land transfer approval by the Anchorage Assembly, which is one of the reasons we're here today to update you. Uh, we anticipate that to be in the fall of 2022. That is part of the approved development, uh, development agreement. And then also upcoming is the three phase plat at the planning board on November 2nd. So, and then finally here, it takes a lot of people to make a project like this happen. This are all of our consultants and our staff. Um, many of you may be familiar with Brandon Marcotte, who is the principal engineer and owner of Triad. Tony Hoffman, uh, who is a senior surveyor with the Boutte Company. Natalie Smyer, who's part of my team, who will uh, is a, are my land development manager and works and manages the Homeowners Associations. Uh, Rick Davidge with an MPA. He is our SWEP manager. Steve Kim Accounting, Mevlin Accounting. Claire James, who does all of our marketing. Our financing will be from New Vision, uh, Tara Tesloff. I've been following Tara Tesloff around for 20 some odd years as she's financed all of my land development projects. And then many of you are familiar with McCollum and Rounds, the legal team that uh, will be creating all the documents for Fulton Hills. Okay, Adam. Yeah, yeah. all right. All so right. what the thing I'd like to address is before I get into this is, um, some of the concerns that we've heard from the community. Now, I will say we went down in July and we gave an initial presentation uh, to the Gerber Board of Supervisors. Uh, it was very well attended by the Gerber community. I think there's well over 40 people there, not to include those online. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised that there's close to 100 people. Uh, there's obviously concerns within the community. Some of those things are, you know, how do we prevent this from just becoming, uh, you know, somebody from Anchorage or out of state purchases it and then turns it into a vacation, you know, like a VRBO, right? Everybody knows what that is. So we were addressing that through, um, you know, codes and, uh, I'm sorry, through covenants through the homeowners associations of requiring a certain percentage to be owner occupied. Um, the other thing that we we did, one of the really great things that came out of the meeting was, I believe it was a uh, someone from the Girdwood Chamber of Commerce recommended or asked if we would be open to having some sort of working group. And we we agreed to that. The working group was is a subcommittee of the land use committee in Girdwood. They I think they elected or elected or appointed. I can't remember how it was seven. done. Seven people. Um, and so we've they've had two meetings. We attended the last one, just provided an update. And the goal of and from our understanding, the purpose of that working group is to come up with recommendations for how this development can help address some of the needs that Girdwood has. So in, in going into um, my presentation here, um, the Crow Creek Neighborhood Land Use Plan. So it was initially when this project started, we, it was under the, we were under the impression that the plan was no longer in effect. Um, I was questioning that as to why I got a, um, I asked legal, MOA legal, the opinion as whether or not this plan is in effect. And the plan is in effect because it was implemented when AWU put in the water line at Holton Hills for the sole purpose of development. So um, when I gave this talk to the HLBAC, it was up in, it was questionable as to whether or not it was, but I got the opinion on Friday of last week that it is in effect. So. This is the Crow Creek Neighborhood Land Use Plan. Um, if you could go to the next page, please. So the, uh, and this isn't the entire plan. I just kind of picked some highlights from it to help help folks get a better historical aspect of, of wh where we are with this project. The approval process for this plan, it, it was approved by the Land Use Committee in Girdwood, the Girdwood Board of Supervisors, the Planning Zoning Commission, HLB Advisory Commission, and then ultimately adopted by the assembly um, uh, in 2006. So this this went through a very robust process. And I know a lot of you are familiar with it, Pete. I know you're familiar with the East Anchorage District Plan and all mm -hmm. the things that go into that West Anchorage District Plan. This is exactly the same thing, all of the same processes. Next page, please. <clears throat> the area of study for this land use plan was this 1,000 acres. Now, if you'll look, you'll see the black line in the middle to the right of that, you'll see um, that 
uh, you'll see the blue dot. So just up from that, um, you'll see the white space up from that. That's called the lower, I'm sorry, the, um, the, the white spots called the lower matrix. The gray spots called the upper matrix. And then above that's called the lower forest. So that's pretty much what we're talking about with Holton Hills. Um, and so this area of study was addressed in the Crow Creek plan. Um, and so we're not addressing any of the other locations, just the lower, the upper matrix, the lower matrix, and the lower forest, part of the lower forest area. If you go to the next slide, please. So again, some of this you saw in um, Connie's presentation, and this is from 2001 to 2004. Um, obviously, at that time when this plan was being developed, it was clear that that Girdwood was outgrowing its its need of private land, um, and that the and again here's a quote: Girdwood's housing demand will grow, and prices for homes and land will continue to increase. And that has become very very true. As you see in 2004, a single lot was going for a hundred thousand. Now that now a single lot's going for three hundred ninety thousand, and in a little under roughly 20 years. And we don't expect that to, to slow down at any point. Next page, please. Um, one of the things about any development that has to happen in this is that ultimately the, the project won't work if revenues don't, don't cover costs, right? And so this is a very difficult area to develop um, due to wetlands, due to topography, drainage, um, not to mention the geotechnical, when I say that, you know, is there bedrock there? There's a whole host of things that make this very complicated. And so um, I think this, this development that Connie has come up with, is prof it, it absolutely is profitable and it, and it will meet the, the cost. Um, the revenues will, will, will meet the cost. If you could go to the next one, please. Um, I don't know if you can expand that for people to see easier. Um, thank you. So one of the things um, in the map and in the plan summary, and I wanna highlight number eight, uh, part of this Crow Creek neighborhood plan is how to provide affordable housing. Uh, and that that is addressed in the plan because one of the things we consistently hear from Girdwood is the term affordable housing or, or um, workforce housing. And so this plan actually addresses how to achieve that to some degree. The other thing that I have highlighted below is you can see that the total 1,000 acres calls for roughly 710 housing units. Um, the, the lower upper and lower forest areas, you can see there's a range there, but you know if you did the max, you're, you're looking at over 200 housing units in, in, the, in those three areas. Now, uh, we don't have uh, complete understanding yet of how many housing units total we're going to have for all three phases. Phase three, we have yet to do the wetlands delineation. We don't fully understand topography in phase three. Right now, our main focus is phase one. Um, we haven't estimated what we think. And again, this is very up in the air because the point of the working group is to help understand, you know, how can we adjust the plat? How, what things can we do to help Girdwood meet some of those um, uh, request that they have. So we're looking at, at a possibility of around between 70 and 80 units. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that's very variable because we, we want to know what the working group comes up with and how we can adjust. So you can see in this plan from 06 that um, they, they were, uh, we, everybody was good with at least a little over 200 housing units in that Holton Hills area. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, this, uh, this area, I just, I highlighted this, um, because again, this addresses Holton Hills, um, land in the upper matrix, some of the most attractive home sites on gently sloping terrain overlooking Glacier Creek. This is one of the benefits to this area, um, is that it is, it is an attractive location for home sites. Yeah. If you go to the next site, please. no, the next slide, please. So. Uh, affordable housing. Um, one of the things in the plan, and I've highlighted the first two options um, or the, the first sections there, if you could go to the third bullet point at the top of the page, um, it, it, it talks about how to develop these HLB lands. And it's either, you know, we sell the land to a private developer, they do it, you know, HLB does all the development, or we do a combination of both. This RFP that was drafted, I believe when um, 
Ms. Quinn Davidson was uh, was mayor, um, did exactly that. It did that third bullet point. That's what this is. It's a partnership between CY Investments and HLB. In regards to the affordable housing component, um, obviously I, I'm not a big fan of just reading off of this, but one of the highlights I want to point out is that it says Girdwood will need to develop their own approach to provide affordable housing. Um, and some of the, and, and I think that's really important because Gird, Girdwood knows itself. Um, and this is another aspect where I wanted to approach the assembly, not only about potential actions that you're going to have to do with this development, but trying to find a way to pro help Girdwood provide affordable housing. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, there's there's two examples that were given in the Crow Creek plan. There's the Teton County Housing Authority in Jackson, Wyoming. And then don't go to the next slide yet, please. But there's uh, Whistler, British Columbia created their own housing authorities. I will be honest with the assembly. Um, I have no idea how to create a housing authority. Um, I don't know the first step to take. I don't know if it's allowed in state law. I don't know if Girdwood um, has the ability right now through actions of just the assembly to do that. I haven't vetted that out. Um, I'm more than happy to facilitate those conversations with the assembly, um, uh, to have conversations with state legislators. If, if, it, if it isn't allowed in state law, um, I did look at both of these locations. Their housing authorities are still up, still operational. Their websites are there. Um, uh, my understanding is this, these have been very successful models. I don't know the details of either of these, but um, this wording here gives some some indication of how they function. But of course, that's not this is not all there is to it. I'm sure there's more to it. So and again, I don't know what it takes to create a housing authority, but it has worked in these other locations that are kind of uh, well, they are. They're, they're resort locations, and they were experiencing the same problem Gerd was experiencing with um, there's a big draw to the location, and housing prices are reflecting that. So I think this would be a good avenue to take, um, but again, I don't know how to do that. Um, you can go to the next page, please. Um, and again, um, this, again, just explains, you know, the Whistler Housing Authority as well. Um, next slide, please. Uh, again, I just wanted to emphasize that the plan um, calls for 710 housing units. And that again, that's not just Holton Hills, that's the entire thousand acres. Um, and at that time in 06, it was assumed that there would be, I don't know how they came up with this, but you know, 13, roughly 1300 uh, people uh, increase into, um, into Girdwood. Is that the last slide or is there another one after that okay um the the plan also addresses the effects of roads and traffic on girdwood um some of the other consequences associated with that so um i know Gird was very con concerned about what the impact of development would be um you know it, it addresses crow creek road it um it addresses potential capacity and again this is based on all 710 units or all 1,000, the development sites in that study area being developed. So um, obviously our traffic numbers would be less than that because we're not developing all the sections in that area of study, just the upper lower matrix and then the lower forest. So um, that the, the traffic, the interconnectivity with trails, um, the wetlands, the drainage, all of that will be addressed when Connie goes and submits for a conditional use permit. And I do want to add, I have Ryan Yell on the line with planning. So if there's any questions in regards to that, Ryan is far more uh, knowledgeable on that than me. Um, and he can address some more specific questions. But a lot of these questions with traffic, drainage, interconnectivity trails, stuff like that um, uh, will be addressed as it goes forward to PNZ. Um, I do want to emphasize Connie has committed to the Girdwood community. Girdwood loves their trails. We have absolutely no desire to get rid of trails. In fact, she's committed to, um, I think, 50 foot buffers on either side of the existing trails to to preserve those and in, in a lot of natural habitat that they have there. So, um, I, you know, we we've we've certainly made sure that um, we're going to emphasize the importance of trails. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, uh, just a second, uh, Mr. Trombley, I. Uh, happened to see on the news last night that uh, 
uh, Alaska DOT is planning to make uh, uh, some changes and improvements to the exit off of the Seward Highway in, into Girdwood. I don't know if any anyone else saw that uh, last mm -hmm. night. Uh, that's been in the works for a while, and I'm I'm wondering if uh, this development will have any or the, the change in the exit off of the highway will have any effects on this uh, new development. Any any ideas on that? Well, or is it too soon to tell? Well, I think it's too soon to tell, but I mean, obviously, this development is is considerably further away from that. I think the access in and out of Girdwood is going to become easier from a traffic safety standpoint. Um, I do believe um, that that exit, as proposed, the last I saw now could very well have changed, will require um, some U.S. Forest Service land or maybe some HLB land, some acquisition of that. But in regards to um, easier access to Girdwood, um, from a safety standpoint, that will be a benefit. But I don't the distance from this, from the from the new interchange, um, will, will not affect this at all. This is further up the road. Okay, great. Thanks. Yep, no problem. And again, I just wanted to emphasize what what we're looking at here um, with in in the plan. This is just kind of a repeat to just show what what it was originally called for in the in the in that plan. Uh, next page, please. Unless that's the last one. Is that the last one? Um, one of the things I didn't mention, it was highlighted in a previous slide, and we don't have to go back to it, is that um, it says this in the plan, affordable housing does not mean low income. Um, you know, the housing and urban development, federal government decides what affordable housing is as a ratio for how much you spend versus how much you make. I think it's like if you're 80% the median, below the median income or something, and you spend 30% of your income on housing, then that's like kind of the definition of affordable housing. However, you know, affordable housing in uh, Anchorage is not the same definition as the affordable housing in Girdwood. So, uh, you know, HUD does not differentiate between Anchorage, Chugai Eagle River, and, and Girdwood, um, even though there is a range of affordability depending on what neighborhood you live in Anchorage versus living in Girdwood. So, I do want to emphasize that, you know, that that's the end of our presentation. We just wanted to give you guys some highlights and um, see if you guys want to drill down with some questions. Well, fantastic. That was uh, quite a presentation. Uh, any questions from uh, members of the committee? Uh, I see a hand go up. Um, not sure who that is. Go go ahead. If you're on the phone, it's I believe it's star six to unmute. Yeah, hi Pete. Uh, it's it's Randy Salt. So through the chair. So, Adam, what is the? I know it was early in the presentation. I might have missed it. What is the total acreage of land that's being released, and then the total acreage that's being developed, and then what happens to that balance of land? Sure, be happy to. We did address that earlier in the slide. So I we're we're just gonna we have the slide here. I'm just gonna go to it. So, the original RFP. Uh, I'm sorry, through the chair, uh, Mr. Salt. Um, the original RFP was for basically 450 acres. I'm, I'm rounding. Um, the three tracks that will be developed into Holton Hills are only 60 acres. So phase one, you're looking at about 16 acres. Phase two, about 18. Phase three, about 26 acres. Once those are developed, the remaining excess land reverts back to HLB. There's no ties to... Um, uh, CY investments. Um. Well, it really is once the boundaries for the three tracks are established mm -hmm. and approved by the planning board through the public process, the excess land will be transferred back to Heritage Land Bank. Uh, and we are preparing that legal addendum at this, at this time. Um, we need to establish these three tracks as identified here on this one, uh, a slide, which is track one green, uh, track two orange, and track three, uh, the forested area as track three. Each of those tracks will be developed separately uh, with appropriate extensions for water, sewer, and roads, and utilities. So um, we will only be working on each phase. Yeah, so any, any areas outside those tracks will be reverted back to Heritage Land Bank. 
as soon as the plat is approved at plat at the planning board for these three tracks. And then just a follow up question, does that affect the price, the purchase price in any way? And I understand some of this might not be able to be shared, but um, does that reversion carry any rebate back to the municipality or um, just how that mechanism works, if you could share any of that? Sure. Um, the original appraisal that was ordered by Heritage Land Bank that was required in the development agreement was for uh, was for a value of 2.1, uh, but it included all of the 448.9 acres. So there's no change in terms of the value of that appraisal. That land will, that value now is just transferred to the three tracks, which does increase the price per acre. Thank you. There will be no adjustment to that. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Mr. Rivera and then Mr. Gates. Go ahead. If you have the floor, Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, I, I guess I, I have a couple of questions for um, representatives of GVOS, who I believe are on the line. Um, so I guess first is, um, I appreciate the discussion that Mr. Trombley had around affordable housing, and um, I appreciate how the uh, plan sort of outlines affordable housing and the, the various criteria, and it sort of makes it a little bit of a, uh, uh, you know, depending on the community, affordable housing might mean something different. So I guess my first question to GVOS is, um, sort of has a Girdwood sort of defined what affordable housing might look for itself. And then just the second question to GVOS would be, uh, you know, I, as I have followed this in the paper, um, you know, I, I, I have read concerns from local residents. So I'm just wondering if you might be able to provide your perspective and, and what you are hearing from um, local residents in Girdwood. Thanks. Can I be recognized, Mr. Chen? Yes, please go ahead. Hi, um, my name is Mike Edgington. I'm co-chair of uh, GBOS and uh, land use supervisor, and I've been obviously following this fairly closely. Um, actually, before I start, can I just point out one small correction to the record that uh, that Mr. Tremblay said? I think he mentioned that the Holton Hills Advisory Committee was a subcommittee of land use. It's actually a subcommittee directly of uh, GBOS. Just a tiny point, but just for correction. Um, to answer Mr. Rivera, uh, I think the the context is that um, you know housing has always been a problem in Girdwood. It became an extreme problem probably even before the pandemic, and has jumped up to whatever is beyond extreme and critical now. Um, we're seeing lots of people who had not got established, basically do not own housing here, um, who are being forced out of the community. People who have been um, members of our community for a decade or longer and have been great contributors to the community. So I think there's a there's kind of a fear and anger about the situation we're in. And uh, the Holton Hills project became kind of a focus of that, rightly or wrongly. Um, so there's been a lot of sort of issues which are completely unconnected to Holton Hills have been brought up as concerns. Um, so um, I would say that um, I think that my personal opinion is there were two really important things in the RFP. One is the requirement for mixed density, and the project does a very good job of that. And the other is to address um, how it ties in with, I will say, workforce housing, um, and then I'll attempt a definition of that. Um, that is not really addressed by the development agreement. So I think that's the that's the area of focus that, the, that our Holton Hills Advisory Committee is really looking at. To answer um, Mr. Rivera's specific question, um, affordability is kind of a tricky term because um, it often uh, it often results in discussion about you know low-income housing tax credits and things like that, which is not really what we're talking about. Um, in the resolution we passed recently, and I think uh, most members have that, um, we talk about um, mid-income housing and workforce housing, and what we really mean is. Um, three related but slightly different things and we haven't quite decided what the balance is between these three for this project but the three things are firstly 
residential housing as opposed to second home and investment uh, property for short term rentals. So places where people actually live permanently, they're primary residents and they are full members of the community. Um, that typically in other resort communities, that's typically done by restrictions on um, often deed restrictions, sometimes covenants um, on occupancy. And that could be owner occupancy or that could be that the property is used as a long term rental for other permanent residents of the community. Um, so one, one is the issue of um, whether it's primary or not. The second one, um, which I think is trickier to do, but uh, other communities have done this, is where they're talking about workforce housing. They mean people who actually work in the community. Um, so it's for workers. And again, that can be either ownership or rental. Um, and again, there would be restrictions around that thing. And the third thing is the issue just of cost itself. And in every case I've seen in other resort communities, that requires a subsidy. Um, of some sort, either a governmental subsidy or a philanthropic subsidy. And uh, it's unclear to me whether HLB is even in the position to do that um, as the landowner or require that because of their um, because of their status of not being able to use tax funding and their requirement to sort of, um, you know, back it as an enterprise. Um, so that was a long answer to a to the question. But basically, we've we've got to the point if we're pulling out these strands and we're putting together a clearer definition of exactly what balance between those we're looking for in this project and more generally across um, Girdwood in terms of our housing policy. And I should just add, I sent an email around just some brief notes about housing to all assembly members uh, at the beginning of this meeting or just after this meeting started. So I have some deeper thoughts there. Did that answer your question, Mr. Rivera, through the chair? Yes, you did. Thank you. That was a very uh, good perspective to hear. Thank you, Mr. Edgington. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Rivera. Thank you, Mr. Edgington. And uh, next we have Mr. Gates and then uh, followed by uh, Mr. Cross. Mr. Gates. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I had one sort of question. You had two questions. The first, I guess, was um, the Holton Hills um, in the slides mentioned having a homeowners association for whole development. And I guess it seemed a little unusual to me uh, if it was one homeowners association for all of these mixed density developments with single family trucks as well as fourplex multifamily uh, units or buildings. Uh, is that really the plan or will there be separate homeowners associations for different phases or types of density developments? Uh, well, I can answer that question in larger projects such as Independence Park or Southport or Eagle Crossing and Eagle River. You have uh, homeowners associations specifically defined for uh, multifamily, for example, or duplex condos. And then uh, you do have a master association overlay in that regard. Oh, yeah, it's so one over the association for the whole development. But you maybe have something like sub uh, subsidiary or Correct. subordinate associations. Right. Each, each let's say, for example, okay. you had. Thanks. Oh, my second. Oh, go okay. ahead. Well, I was just going to use as an example. For example, if you had like three eight plexes, they would have the, that were condominiums. They would have their own association because they have certain items that would be uh, of particular needs for that type of housing unit. But then they would ultimately have a board member that would then go to the master association. I see. Okay, great. Well, well, thank you for that. Um, we have Mr. Yeah, Cross next and, and then- I had uh, a second question if I could. Oh, uh, Mr. Gates, continue then. Sorry, thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, the second was just, uh, I know you mentioned it throughout the presentation. Uh, some actions are needed by the assembly and there's actions, of course, by the planning board and uh, other boards that like conditional use that the assembly wouldn't be seen or considering. But uh, which actions would be coming before the assembly soon? And I guess the first one was the HOB master plan update or the Goodwood area plan? No, none of those um, 
None of those. Uh, the, the Girdwood area plan is what it is. Um, and then the Crow Creek land use plan is what it is. The only thing that would be coming before the assembly as of now would be the land transfer. Um, that has to be approved by the assembly. It is possible in the future that a rezone will come before the assembly, but for now that rezone has been put on hold. The only thing that will be coming before the assembly is the approval for the land transfer. And we do not have a date certain yet on that. We want to hear from the uh, working group um, and just, just understand a little bit more from that working group before we come to the to, to the assembly for the for the transfer. Great, thank you. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Gates and Mr. Trombley. Uh, we'll go to Mr. Cross next, and uh, Mr. Constant is in the queue after that. And um, I neglected to mention that Mr. Constant joined us about 25 minutes ago on the phone. Um, Mr. Cross. Thank you. And so, you know, the affordable housing keeps creeping up. That's the biggest concern of the Girdwood community. We hear that. Um, and that's a real we got to recognize that listen unless someone's willing to lose money or the municipality is willing to do that private developers are not going to intentionally lose money to develop affordable housing i mean they have to build it to market because they're not nonprofit agencies that can just eat that expense and the cost of construction girdwood is ridiculous not just the land cost but you know anybody who's ever done a project at your house realizes that uh, you're in the middle of a project and you need some sheetrock screws or you need some mud and tape or you just need something there's no hardware store there's nothing that's anywhere near that's a half a day trip it's an hour and a half to anchorage go through the store and it eats up time so you're probably looking at about a 30 percent cost increase over the cost of construction anchorage just in additional time just due to logistics not to mention all the other complications that surround it so i mean We'd have to work with that. I, I think they have, but but Girdwood has more than an affordable housing issue. It has a housing issue in general, which is they need more houses. And so, although these aren't what would be considered affordable housing, even more housing is a step in the right direction. I think the only way you're really going to address the affordable housing issue is with some adjustments to code that allow for large lots with modulars, not not mobile home parks, but we go down to 2,000, 3,000 square foot lots, put tiny homes, share parking, and we seriously look at readjusting some of the restrictions we put on land development out there to allow for the workforce housing. Because, uh, you know, in less in, le in, in an affordable housing demand, you know, it isn't to me, it's not a metric. It's not a metric of what the percentage is. It is affordable housing is rental units that you can get for like under, say, 1750 a month. If you own enough in rental properties, you own it, you realize that that good two bedroom, one bath rental properties that you can pick up for under seventeen hundred dollars a month or so. There's so much you go put an ad out on, on any kind of marketplace and you're going to get bombarded by hundreds of people. OK, that's that affordability index, particularly with the cost of fuel or whatever it is. I mean, so I, I guess, you know, I was really apprehensive about this project and looking at it and uh, and. But I think we understand that this can't solve all the problems. Uh, we do have 450 acres there, and so maybe we look at some of those other things for more for addressing some of those other future needs. But um, that's just my thoughts on that. Uh, if you have any more thoughts, if uh, Adam has anything on how to address some of those affordable housing issues or any of those, you know, thoughts that I threw out there as far as not mobile homes, you can't do mobile homes in Anchorage anymore, but they do make really nice modulars. You build off site or tiny homes and slide them in there. Your thoughts on that process. But um, and then in closing, if I would, uh, I, I don't see that. Can, can someone please make this PowerPoint available so I can go through, reread the notes and I get lots of emails regarding the concern about this project, so this will give me some bullet points to address some of their concerns. So, uh, thank um, you. So, uh, the PowerPoint and all the handouts are available on the committee web page. We do have that posted. Thank you, Ms. Honest. Yeah, actually, those those were available uh, several days ago. I was reading them over the weekend. Mr. Chairman, can I? Hey, can, can, I can we still get those emailed to us? Certainly, yeah, uh, Ms. Honest can Thank uh, you. Email, email, email that to the committee members. Ms. Mr. Chairman, can 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 we can we respond really quick to some of the questions from Mr. Cross? Please do, Mr. Trumpley. Thanks. Okay, so there's just a couple of things I'll address, and then and then uh, Connie will as well. So there, I think every well maybe not everybody, but so in Title Twenty One. Um, Girdwood has their own chapters, chapter nine. 
And chapter nine is very, uh, creates challenges with developing in Girdwood. Um, we are going to be looking internally at chapter nine about what can we do to simplify the code, very similar to the omnibus ordinance that we did with the other Title 21 that you guys approved unanimously. We're going to be looking at the zoning rules around that. Uh, we'll, you know, we'll run that through GBOS, all the, all the normal processes, of course, but we, we will be looking at that. Um, I think when it comes to affordable, I think, Mr. Cross, you said that uh, well. Um, like I said, Connie's a land developer. She doesn't build homes, right? So when these these lots are going to be open for sale for anybody. So if, you know, Cook Inlet Housing wants to come in and purchase lots and, and build some sort of um, subsidized housing, they're, they're available to do that. Catholic Social Services, you know, whatever. Um, but I think it's really important to understand that the affordable housing component doesn't come in until you start going vertical. And what I mean by that is building a home vertical, right? Whatever that is, an eightplex, a tenplex, a single family home, whatever it is. You know, if it costs a million dollars to build a fourplex, you in order to bring down the rent, in order to bring down the cost, you have to offset your capital expenditures. How do you do that? Is it a grant through Catholic Social Services? Is it some sort of HUD funding? Um, you know, those are the things that I think are the creative ideas that people have to use. But also remember, the plan addresses that Girdwood should also take take the lead on affordable housing as well and, and look into that housing authority model um, that was addressed in the plan. So, and again, what that looks like, you know, a lot of those from what I have read is that there, there does provide some element of subsidy associated with new housing development um, or rents. Um, where the funding comes from, I don't know. I haven't dug that deep into it, but I think that's what a housing authority addresses. Connie? Well, um, we have a wide <clears throat> variety of topo. We have a lot of uphill and we have a lot of downhill. And one of the things that we can encourage the builders to do is to put in an accessory dwelling unit in uh, a, a lower level, for example, um, behind a garage, uh, as long as it qualifies with an exterior access and the bedroom has a window. The same thing is true. Um, we have some land that is gonna go downhill. So that would accommodate a ranch with a lower level. And again, our hope is, and we could put into our architectural control, if you have that opportunity, to actually put in an accessory dwelling unit, you should do that. And that dwelling unit could be as much as 600, 800, 900 square feet. It could have uh, two bedrooms, it could have a bath, and it would be ideal for workforce housing. Uh, and then the other thing is there have been changes through the Alaska Housing Finance Corporation where um, in the past, uh, if someone wanted to help support a first time home buyer or uh, any buyer, but they didn't have the necessary down payment. The Alaska Housing Finance Corporation is now allowing for uh, someone to make that contribution to assist that home buyer and without having to live in the residence. Uh, they don't even have to be uh, living in the state of Alaska. So I think they're going to come uh, out with some other creative loan programs as well. I have talked to the Alaska Housing Finance Corporation about there used to be special financing for firefighters and teachers. They've disbanded with that program, but I'm gonna talk to them and try to put some pressure. We all need that sort of help, not just in Girdwood, but in Anchorage as well. And that's the role of the Alaska Housing Finance Corporation is to assist in creating affordable opportunities for home ownership. Okay, fantastic. Uh, I've got Mr. Constant next, and I did see a hand go up a minute ago. I'm not sure exactly who that was, but you you would be next in the queue after Mr. Constant. Chris, you have the floor. Have the floor. Proceed. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Proceed. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. Uh, two things. One, uh, Mike, Mr. Edgington, I heard you talking about restrictions or uh, 
elements that GBOS may want or may may put on the project. And I want us to all be really clear that the role of GBOS is advisory to the process. And so it's really important that we work together to come up with the right requirements, but GBOS can't put requirements or restrictions on the project. Um, and then the second thing is, and I've mentioned this to some folks before, I'm aware of a project in California in which a developer struggled with some community opposition for a number of years. And one of the elements that they did to help the community support the project was to provide for a local resident purchase option for, I think it was probably three months, advanced marketing. Is it feasible that folks from Girdwood could be allowed the right of first refusal? I have to check with legal. We have all sorts of fair housing rules and regulations that we have to follow now, but um, we have done that in another project. Uh, maybe not for a three month period of time, but we, we have this option to take reservations. Uh, and then at the time the plat is recorded with the individual lots uh, to turn it into a purchase and sale agreement. I could tell you I have had multiple calls uh, from the start when this project was first announced uh, from local residents as well as Anchorage and people wanting to move there and from around the state and that sort of thing. I do not have a list. <laughs> Let me just say this. I do not have a list. I don't have cell phone numbers. I don't have email addresses because I didn't feel we were ready at, uh, at that point. So when we get to that point when we can start taking a reservation, once the track has been, the tracks have been transferred, once we can go ahead with our preliminary plat, you know, um, I would like to do that. Let me just say that, Chris, I would like to do that. Um, despite all the halt Holton Hill signs that are out in the community, I do think that they should have an opportunity to do that if it's legally possible. So thank you for the question. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Mr. Constant, and I believe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Edgington had his hand up. You you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, um, I definitely take uh, Mr. Constant's uh, point about uh, GBOS being advisory. I try very careful to be uh, accurate in my language, and uh, I try to use the phrase GBOS would request a requirement in the project. I apologize if I misspoke or it wasn't clear. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge that uh, I like to thank the assembly for um, for actually making the changes to Girdwood's ADU rules and regulations, which gives more flexibility. And I think this is a, a good example of uh, a project where that flexibility can be uh, made use of. And I think there were some good changes on the floor as well, good amendments on the floor at the last meeting. And uh, the other quick point I'd like to make is um, that I think the I think even in um, again through the chair, Mr. Cross's comments. Um, about affordability, this ties in with this problem we're having with language of when we as a community are talking about affordability, we're not just talking about low income. We're talking about, um, you know, the, the market provides housing for people who are probably two or three times um, median income in the community. Uh, it does a very poor job of people who are at median income at 150 percent of median income. Um, so when we're talking about affordability, we're not just talking about low, low, low cost or very low cost. We're talking about costs which would be considered, you know, middle to upper middle um, in other communities or other parts of Anchorage. I mean, I, I doubt there is a I doubt there is a two bedroom home or three bedroom home available within the community to rent for less than three or three and a half thousand uh, a month, which uh, which means, you know, it it becomes. You have to have a household income of quite a bit above 100,000 a year to um, for that to be quote affordable. Um, so we're having problems. Uh, businesses are having problems recruiting professionals. It's not again just service workers. It's architects. It's managers at the resort and this sort of thing. And um, uh, the other point I was going to say is there there is um, again there are quite a few policies and things we've uh, we've thought about. We've looked quite carefully at issues in uh, chapter nine. So uh, again, this is a uh, this is a kind of advertisement of uh, there's been a lot of a lot of study and uh, and local attention to many of the problems. So I just uh, encourage uh, Mr. Tremblay to uh, to reach out and have that discussion, you know, with us as a community as well. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank thank you, Mr. Edgington. Okay, we are 
past the first hour of our meeting. Um, any any other questions from members of the committee or comments from uh, Mr. Trombley? Um, not we'll move on to the next item. Nope, nothing from me. I'm happy to talk about the next item. OK, fantastic. Well, I think the next item then would be expanding uh, the Central Spinard uh, deteriorated area, if I'm not mistaken. Nope, and... that, that's absolutely correct, Chairman. Um, so I was approached. I'm, I'm hoping Mr. Shooty's on on the line. Um, are, Chris, are you on there on the line by any chance? Well, uh, I don't I don't hear him, but here's what uh, let me pull it up really quick. If you could pull that up, I'd appreciate it. Oh, Chris, Chris is online, but he says his mic isn't working, so I guess. Chris, if you want to just shoot me an email with anything that I'm saying that may very well be incorrect or uh, anything I'm not adding, I'd, I'd appreciate it. And then I can share that with the with the committee. Um, Mr. Shooty came to me probably two months ago wanting to expand the Spinard area, Spinard deteriorated property area. I'm probably butchering that. Um, you guys created the central Spinard deteriorated area I think in 2020, and it encompassed a certain location. Um, there's some development. A guy wants to do some, uh, wants to tear down some um, old dilapidated housing and build new multifamily housing. Uh, obviously, these deteriorated areas um, help give you the advantage of qualifying for deteriorated properties, but he's just outside the expansion area. Um, in the further conversations we've had, it, it appears that there's it, it has grown um, from the initial conversation that we had. But you can see from the map, the the blue area is what is existing. And we're wanting to expand it to the red. Um, that would take an action to the assembly. And again, I'd, I'd like to talk to you guys ahead of time. Um, I would like to talk to you guys ahead of time so that this stuff doesn't come cold to you at the assembly, you know, on the floor. And this would just help revitalize the area with additional housing. What you've seen what Cook Inlet has done. JJ Brooks has some areas in there that he's redeveloping. And I, th I think this would go a long way to add to our housing stock and redevelop the area. Um, that's pretty much all I have. Um, Chris is, I guess, going to try and call in um, and we'll see if he comes in. But I'm, I'm happy to take any questions while we wait for Chris. OK, well, thank, thank you, Mr. Trombley. Do we have any questions from members of the committee for Mr. Trombley about the expansion of this sp Spinard deteriorated? Uh, um, Kevin, mystic? Kevin Cross here. Um, Kevin, go yeah, ahead. I'm familiar with uh, a lot of real estate in this area. Uh, I know on 40th, uh, there's a couple dilapidated properties that have uh, gone distressed. That large lot on Mr. Hay Chairman, or on Chuyak Way is there. No. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I didn't. No one had the floor um, when I tried to unmute. I'll put myself. Oh, in that here. that large lot on Chuyak Way has DEC issues. It used to have a mechanic shop on it that they removed, but there were some old vehicles and fuel tanks that were buried, so that has significant EPA issues. In fact, there's a couple DEC. If I go to the map, if I remember, there's one or two because there's some older houses in there with buried heating fuel tanks as well. And so, tell me what this. Help me explain, uh, since you know, uh, just being a couple months here on the assembly, what that would mean. What did, if this becomes and you expand in this area, what kind of opportunities that afford, uh, or what does that, what would the implications be for property owners in these areas? Sure. So when you so when you expand an area, it allows you to really apply for that deteriorated property. Um, you there's an application process lined out in Title 12, but what that does is that when you are granted that and I don't know I think there's a time limit on it I can't remember but you basically get um, your portion of your mill rate for muni taxes property taxes and the ASD portion of your of your tax bill um, eliminated for I don't remember if it's 10 12 or 15 years but there's a period of time that you don't have to 
pay the property tax on it. And what that does, and again, it kind of goes back to our previous conversation about helping with those those capital costs over time. And again, I'm, I'm not an expert on redevelopment, but that's what that does. OK, thank great. Thank, thank you, Mr. Cross. And, and uh, I believe Mr. Schutte is dialed in and available. Go ahead, Mr. Schutte. Hey, Chris, that's great, Chris. Thanks. Could you could you explain a little bit more of the reasoning behind it and you know your original approach and stuff? That would be helpful to the committee, I believe. So while we wait for Mr. Schutte, could I? Hello, good morning. Are you able go. to hear me? Oh, there he is. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I apologize for the technical difficulties this morning. I could hear you all via Teams, but the uh, mic wasn't working. Um, so uh, just to follow up on, on what uh, you said, Adam, um, all of that is correct. Um, I wanted to highlight the points that Assemblymember Cross raised about some of the known conditions and unknown conditions of properties in the area. Um, we have been talking to uh, uh, not the owner of the parcel that Mr. Cross referenced, but to the real estate broker. And um, uh, the, there's certainly not only uh, DEC issues on some of these parcels, um, but more importantly, there's a general condition of deterioration that's occurred over the past you know, 40 to 50 years of development in Spinard. And we're beginning to see um, some of the positive benefits of the central Spinar deteriorated area on that north side of Chugach Way. And so um, you mentioned uh, Quick, Inlet, Quick Inlet Housing and JJ Brooks, two of the largest uh, property owners within the current uh, CSDA. Uh, uh, and you've seen Cook Inlets uh, just put up uh, two buildings on their portion of it. They've got more projects in the works. Uh, Mr. Brooks, who owns the uh, trailer parks on the eastern side, closest to Arctic, uh, is in some of his um, conceptual pre-design work on those areas. And then um, across the street on the south side of Chugach Way in the areas where um, it, it's currently not in the CSDA, um, we are seeing interest from individual property owners and uh, collection of property owners in trying to do something in that area because of the positive benefits they're seeing from uh, stuff happening within the current CSDA. Uh, and so there's a number uh, of properties stretching down to about 40th Avenue uh, that are ripe for redevelopment. As you can see from the image on the screen, um, uh, there's a park, uh, Wilson Street Park in the area. There's sections of Fish Creek uh, uh, or former Fish Creek in the area. Um, as well as some vibrant commercial activity that's occurring both on the Minnesota side to the west and the Arctic side to the east. And so um, that combined with um, a property owner who's got parcels within the Wilshire Avenue area to the on the top of that screen there to the north that was excluded previously, um, he's looking to uh, sell his properties. Uh, this is an individual who came into them through uh, his family estate. And unfortunately, the condition of the properties, like many in the area, is pretty grim. And in, he cannot actually get those properties sold without literally scrapping the buildings entirely and scraping it down to the raw land. But to do that, he's looking at some pretty exorbitant costs. And so now he's considering, well, what can I do uh, in the meantime with redevelopment? Or uh, should the CSDA be expanded, would my property become uh, more developable to someone other than me should I sell it? So. Um, a couple of those property owners uh, have reached out, and uh, uh, like Mr. Trombley said, we had an initial discussion with Mr. Trombley about the uh, possibility of considering it, um, and that's where we're at today. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Schutte. I've, I've got Mr. Constant followed by Mr. Gates. You have the floor, Mr. Constant. Thank you. So I have two questions. Um, one, Mr. Trombley, when you described it, I think that you said it, it abates the taxes on the property. Is, is that the way it is, or is it a tax abatement on the improvements, meaning the actual upgrades aren't taxed for 10 years? I don't know that we actually wipe all taxes from a property for 10 or whatever, 12 years. 
And then the second question I have is more about the boundaries. I don't have the map in front of me. I previously sat down, I think, with, with Chris Schutte, the conversation maybe with you, Adam, and discussed making sure we weren't just looking at one or two properties. Did we expand the boundaries substantially enough to make it more of an area-wide change than a very targeted change? Area-wide meaning several blocks. Sure. Uh, through the chair, Mr. Constant, um, I will get back with you. I, I I may very well be wrong on that tax abatement question. I, I'd have to talk to Ben Bowman in legal because he's really good at it. Unless Chris knows the answer, I, I but again, I could be wrong, but I, I can get clarification. The second one, initially, it was going to be very targeted to like, I think, four lots, but this expands it. This map here expands it. Okay, good. Thank you. I think that's better. Okay, I look forward to that question because my understanding in previous abatements was it's on the improvements, not on the underlying tax. But thanks. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Constant. M Mr. Gates, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to comment um, first on that recent discussion about uh, the tax abatement for exemption and deferral. Um, and I think this is one of the distinctions between economic development property, where uh, you have a tax incentive for tax uh, exemption or deferral just for the improvements and deteriorated property, where, and you know, I want to take this with a grain of salt because I need to actually read more carefully, but I think deteriorated property, you can get it for the property, not just the improvements that you're making. Part of that's because you may be demolishing improvements that the property. Uh, I guess there may be some other reasons, but um, I guess when you get through, uh, you do, somebody may be clarify me if I'm mistaken here, but I think that's the distinction between the two and um, the extent to that tax abatement exemption. And anyways, I asked to speak also because uh, I wanted to um, describe briefly uh, related to Mr. Cross's question about you know, what does it mean for the property owners and the deteriorated area and the tax abatement or exemption or deferral. It's a big two-step process. The first step is designating an area and then the property owners, that's the assembly action. It's uh, through a recommendation from the uh, chief fiscal officer. And you can read all about it in chapter 1235 of our code. Uh, the deteriorated property section is 1235.50. But don't skip the definitions and the uh, uh, application uh, requirements, which are also in chapter 1235. Those are important. So that first step is detour uh, designating the area is deteriorated. And then the property owners, the owners of property within the area, can then that second step apply for um, the tax for the exemption for their specific property and uh, following the application process. Uh, I hope that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gates. And I've got uh, Mr. Schutte in the queue next. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, through the chair, I was just going to compliment what Assembly Council um, described as far as the machinations of the uh, deteriorated property tax code <laughs> sections. Uh, it is a two-step process. Step one, of course, is saying this is the area that we believe meets the criteria in code and the reasons why. And then step two is up to the individuals who are doing any kind of redevelopment uh, or development within the area to put together a pro forma that must be uh, presented to and reviewed by the, the CFO um, that demonstrates uh, what they're doing and how the tax abatement plays into their overall economics for redevelopment or development and it's up to the to the cfo to make the determination that yes based on the uh, finances that you've presented there is a clear case that without this tax abatement there would be uh, you would be unable to develop or redevelop the area uh, and therefore uh, they will the cfo makes the recommendation for approval um, it is granular though there is no set period of time or amount of uh, tax abatement or, or uh, tax deferral. Um, those are both determined by the CFO during that application process, the second step process. 
and it is ultimately the CFO's recommendations that come forward to the Anchorage Assembly for approval. Um, in some cases, they do. The CFO does recommend 100% abatement, uh, but in other cases, they don't. And you know, two most recent cases that were before the body, uh, one or actually, I guess three cases. One was a 100% uh, tax abatement uh, recommendation. One was uh, equivalent to about a 92% tax abatement, just based on some uh, previously existing improvements that the the property owner had made. And then others um, have been uh, less, whether the, the amount was less or the duration was less. So the code outlines what the limits are, but that's not always what the CFO recommends. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Schutte. I have Mr. Gates in the queue. We have the floor, sir. Um, thank you. I uh, plan to mention, but uh, omitted one other benefit uh, if an application for a property owner for their project or improvement to renovation demolition is approved. They may also be recommended for um, some fee relief from a lot of the uh, development fees. Those are listed in 1235 and 55. Demolition permit fees, uh, grading fees, excavation fees, some of the other permit fees. And there's a long list there. And so that's designed as well to provide some incentive for a property owner developer to renovate distressed territory properties. Okay. All right. Well, thank thank you for that. Any other questions or comments from members of the committee? Any last comments, uh, Mr. Trombley? Yeah, I just want to say again, thanks for the time on this. And what I'm going to do is we'll we'll draft up an ordinance. Um, you know, I'll have to run it through my normal channels of of approval and and writing it up and stuff. So yeah, I don't I can't say when you're going to see this, but hopefully hopefully within the next couple months you'll be you'll you'll see this. And um, if you require a further work session, I'm happy to participate in that as well. Okay, great. We appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Trombley. All right, uh, I think we'll go on to uh, some old business that just happened to come up uh, yesterday or recently with an email I received and forwarded uh, from the building board about some um, uh, changes to code that we made last year. And uh, so this, I guess, is something that the committee will probably have to put on our agenda and take up at our at our next meeting if the assembly doesn't decide that we need a, a work session on this prior to uh, the the next meeting of this committee um but yeah we, we made some we made some adjustments to try to allow some homeowners of some leeway in in making some improvements to their property and i think the building board got the feeling we we went a little bit too far um what what what's your thoughts on that mr Tromway? Sure. Um, so I, I haven't responded in emails because I wanted to address it here. I, I think it, putting it on the next meeting would be good. That way we could have um, some staff members here that are far more knowledgeable than me on it. But uh, what we have done, because we were looking for greater clarification and wanted to talk to the assembly about it, was we've kind of put a hold on that aspect of code and not issued any permits in regards to that until we get uh, your guys' involvement and and get you guys a little more spooled up on the topic as well. So it's not immediate because we're not issuing permits, but it's something that needs to be addressed. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that. We'll, uh, Miss Honest, we'll have to make sure that that's an item that we uh, we get on our uh, agenda to to cover at our our next monthly meeting. And. Any other uh, questions or comments from members of the committee right now? Not see anyone else in the queue. And next thing I guess will be, we'll go to audience participation. If there are members of the audience, you've got 
uh, three minutes to speak. If you're on mute now, to unmute, it's star six, I believe. And uh, to make your comment, uh, uh, state your name and, and the portion of town that, that you live in. Um, not seeing or hearing anything, I guess I will take a motion for adjournment. Motion to adjourn. Okay, great. Thank you. We are adjourned and that was a, an excellent meeting today and uh, everyone enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.